Low River family, thank you so much for joining us again. No matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, in Abilene, out of Abilene, out of state, out of country, we don't care. If you're with us, we consider you part of our online River family. So thank you so much for joining us. If you have prayer needs, please let us know. You can send us an email at office at the river Abilene.com, office at the river Abilene.com, and we will definitely be in prayer for you. Uh, we want to let you know about a few things that are going on in the life of uh, the congregation. Uh, first of all, if you're ever by here and you want a little Christmas photo op, there's a cool little photo op right in front of the office that is going to be set up through the whole month and, and into uh, January as well. Feel free to come do that. December, we have a lot of missions going on. Uh, we have a big Christmas tree in the middle of our, of our welcome space. And we are taking donations of food or toiletries uh, for On the Way Home Ministries. We do this every year. You can put that underneath. On the tree will be um, some little names for people from Men of Nehemiah. They are a ministry that we support here that help men through discipline and through Christ get off uh, uh, escape addiction. And if you'd like to participate with that, you can take a name, pray for it all year long, and uh, for $25, you can provide for some of their basic needs as a, as a Christmas gift. So that's a great ministry that you can be a part of. Also, our River students are having their Christmas party this Wednesday. Uh, you can go on the website and get information from that or contact Anthony or Maria for that kind of information. So um, I want to encourage you that there's a great way to be a part of this church, even if you're not here physically. And that is you can be a part of this church through giving. And uh, you can give uh, by sending a check to 539 U.S. Highway 83, Abilene, Texas, 79602. Uh, you can give by Secure Text at 84321, or you can give by going to our website, theriverabilene.com, theriverabilene.com. Go to the drop down, and you can securely give there. It is a powerful act to give so that the kingdom advances. So I encourage you uh, to do that. Here's a question. Here's a question about submission concept we all love. Which state of the 50 states has the highest number of citations per population for speeding? Which state is it? I'll see you in a little bit. There's a name that levels mountains Carves out highways through the sea I've seen its power unravel battles Right in front of me There's a faith that stands defiant I've seen his praise unraveled shackles 
right off my feet. Come on, because that's the power. That's the power of your name. And just the mention makes a way. Giants fall and strongholds break. And there is healing. And that's the mighty name of Jesus.
Church, I really feel strongly this song has been heavy on my spirit the last few days about breakthrough and about victory. And I feel like I feel like there is multiple people here this morning who need a breakthrough, who need a victory, whether that's in your health, whether that's in your finances, whether that's in your relationships. I don't know what that is, but this morning, you know what that is. You know where you are, and God knows where you are, and he knows what breakthrough that you need. And this morning, I encourage you, don't let this time pass without boldly asking God for that breakthrough, without boldly going before him and saying, God, I need a victory. I need a victory this morning. So if that's you, just where you are, we're going to, we're going to sing this. There will be victory here. And as we sing this, I want you to just receive. Receive what God has for you this morning, church. Amen. church.
Christmas isn't really about snow and lights and chimneys and presents. It's not about malls and movies and bells and sleighs. It's not about cards and carols and candy and cheer. Christmas is about a king. A king who became a baby and a baby who became a savior. Christmas is about a light that shatters the darkness and begins a new day. Christmas is about a gift, not a toy wrapped in paper, but a savior swaddled in a manger. Christmas is about a home, the savior leaving his so we could have one forever. Christmas is about the creator who entered into creation and shared in our humanity, but never our depravity. Christmas is about a cross because there's no heaven without Calvary and no Calvary without Bethlehem. Christmas is about Jesus. He's the reason for the season and every season and every day, hour, and moment. Christmas is about you. Because while it's true that Christ came into the world for you, don't forget that you came into the world for Christ. Logan River family, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, let's continue to discover that we can be seemingly insignificant, but very significant in the kingdom of God. Um, we're going to continue to learn more about that as we go through um, the, the birth narrative of Christ and all that happened and the seemingly insignificant players in that uh, entire story. The state with the highest number of citations for speeding, percentage-wise, is the state of Ohio. So what that tells me, that's 14.95% of their drivers have been cited for speeding. Now here's what's uh, interesting to me as someone who is potentially, not confessing a line, just potentially has maybe broken the law that way. Isn't it kind of a matter of our priorities, our egocentrism versus a submission to a potentially a greater good? And I don't know about you, but that is a little bit difficult for me. Today we're going to learn a little bit more about someone who is seemingly insignificant, who finds that through the process of submission, they become deeply significant in the story of God's kingdom. Last week we learned about Zechariah. He's a one of 18,000 priests. Him and his wife Elizabeth live in the hill country. They're nobodies. And God shows up while he's in the holy place and tells him he's going to have a son. He doesn't believe it. So God gives him the gift, the grace, the gift of silence and isolation. And in that process, he begins to adopt, make it a part of his DNA, the promise that was given that his son was going to prepare the way for the Messiah. Today, we're going to go to a little village that doesn't even exist anymore. Let's go to the Lord. Lord, I thank you for your word. Thank you for the challenge of your word and how you can um, take seemingly insignificant people, seemingly insignificant events, and you can turn them into something supernatural, powerful, kingdom-minded, redemption-minded. Help us, Lord, absorb the thought that we can be a part of that process that we can be pieces of the puzzle that is the mosaic of the kingdom of God, is the mosaic of the, of the heart and the passion of God Almighty. And Lord, as for me, I pray that I would decrease and you would increase and be our preacher and teacher today. And all people said, amen. I hope you said amen to somebody. If you have a Bible, we're continuing in the story in Luke. So if you go to Luke chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 28. Now it tags last week's story about uh, Elizabeth and Zechariah and eventually John the Baptist. And it's going to continue by introducing somebody brand new. Starting in verse uh, 26 of Luke chapter 1. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, now remember we've just come out of that story, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth 
a town in Galilee. Now let's stop there for just a minute. Gabriel, the big dude, now he's already talked to Zechariah. Now he has flown over to, to Nazareth. They're not next to each other. And he is now about to proclaim another amazing promise to somebody. Now let me tell you about Nazareth. Until 1962, people would question its existence because we just didn't have anything on it. Nothing had been dug up. There had been no inscriptions. Nothing had been found. And at one point, there was this, um, uh, there was this dig uh, in Caesarea Maritama. That's what it used to be. Uh, Caesarea Philippi is what it used to be. Caesarea Maritama, where they found an inscription that was part of the lineage of priests citing the village of Nazareth. So we basically know where Nazareth was. It's, it's nowhere. Never mentioned in uh, Jewish literature at that particular time. Not ever mentioned in the Old Testament. Nazareth is a tiny little village of 1,600 to 2,000 people. It's not on anybody's priority list or map. It's a nobody village. And currently, um, we have allusions and pieces of where we know where, where it was, but shortly after this, it just disappears from the map. It's destroyed and, and just goes away. It's, it's nowhere. And Gabriel shows up to nowhere. So Gabriel shows up, and he shows up to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was, was Mary. Now the word uh, virgin is the word parthenos. Now, Parthenos means um, young, unmarried woman. And here's where people will try to mess with um, the truth of the Scripture. One, they'll talk about Nazareth. Oh, see, there we have no proof of that. Now we have proof of that, that there was Nazareth. Parthenos in almost never has meant a, a woman who has experience. Are you following me, adults? But the overwhelming majority of the time, it means a young, unmarried woman who is inexperienced. Hope you're understanding my language there. And to try to plug in a 0.01111% possibility in this is bad exegetical work. Contextually, also we see from Isaiah 9, this is someone, this is a young woman who is um, inexperienced. I hope I'm being kind for the children today. So, it is a Parthenos. Her name is Mary. She's a nobody in a nobody village. She is pledged to be married, which means she's somewhere between the age of 12 and 14. Pledged means the contract has been brought up. She's somewhere in the year process of preparation. In the year process of preparation, the bride lives with her family. The groom lives with his family. He's got a year to prepare for taking care of her. They are seen as uh, married, but they haven't come together yet. The ceremony hasn't uh, happened yet. So in this particular time, if there is um, any monkey business, it's infidelity and is settled through divorce or potentially other worse means. So pledged, untouched, inexperienced, a nobody in a nobody village. Seems weird to say because of the name Mary and what it means to us today. She's uh, married, uh, pledged to be married to a man named Joseph. Now that's important. Uh, Joseph is of the house of David. The lineage of the Messiah must come through the house of David. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Now... <laughs> This is the same greeting that Gideon gets. Um, and it says, just after that, Mary was greatly troubled at his words and was wondering what kind of greeting this might be. That she, she knows the text. She knows that when Gideon was called, he was highly favored. And yet Gideon was of the smallest, most insignificant tribe. And he was the smallest and most in, is the insignificant person of the tribe. So you're getting a picture of God pulling significance out of insignificance. A nobody village, a nobody person. She's a teenager, okay? 
And he says, she was wondering what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor, charis, grace with God. You will receive, you will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus. Jesus is the Greek transliteration of Joshua or Yeshua. And it means Yahweh saves. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. Now, Luke employs um, Old Testament names to give a grand nature to the fact that this is not um, adoptionistic, that you have a, 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 a person who eventually became the Messiah. This is proof that this is God's Son. El Elyon, God Most High. The Lord will give him to his fr- uh, the throne of his father David, and he'll reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. So she's getting a download of this magnificent promise. Amazing promise. Um, and when he talks about God in the second part of that, he's, he's using the word Elohim, Yahweh, God. He's blowing up the fact that, that it's some sort of um, deity engaging in intimacy, are you following me, to create some sort of godson. He's erasing that. And here's, here's the amazing thing. We get a question. Do you remember Zechariah's question? Zechariah asked a question. He said, you're going to have a baby, and him and his wife are beyond that capability. And all he can think of is, this, I'm an old man. Well, Mary questions too, but the reaction of the angel is a little bit different. Now watch what she said. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin, Parthenos? Now, you know questions. If you raise kids, if, if you say, um, if you say, take out the trash, and your kid says, why in the world would I take out the trash? I'm gaming on the computer right now. Or, how would you like me to take out the trash? Two different responses. One's from a heart of, I'll do it, I just need some more information. One's from the heart of, of there's no way you, you can make this happen. Her response is coming from, uh, sure. Sure. Tell me how this is going to happen because I'm not currently engaging in any activity that can make that happen. Now watch what happens. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born to you will be called the Son of God. And then he gives her even a little more information. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. What comes out of God's mouth, God will make happen. He's downloading information to her. He tells her a little bit about how it's going to go. Now, what's her reaction? I'm the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. What? The big boy, Gabriel, shows up. God's might. God's might. God's might shows up to a nobody, 13-year-old peasant girl pledged to be married and says, you're going to carry the Messiah, which is going to create all kinds of weirdness. And she says, I'll be your servant. What you say sounds good to me. What? That ready, wacky submission astounds me. I mean, I don't think we submit or honor each other very well as it, as it goes whenever there's tension or, or difficulty or things are going to get anxious. It's like this, this couple, this, this man, 
he, he, he and his wife would argue a lot and he would just yell, yell, yell and she wouldn't do anything. She was just so quiet. And finally one day he said, I don't know how you put up with me. I yell at you all the time and we have these big arguments and you just, you just walk away. You don't even yell back at me. How do you do that? She said, well, I just go into the bathroom and I start cleaning the toilet. Really? That helps? Yeah. I clean it with your toothbrush. So that's a different, that's how we are maybe, but not Mary. You know, the nobody, peasant teenage girl in a nobody village says, I'm your servant, let's do what you want to do. Now, I think, and we hear sermons about this all the time, that she's going to face controversy. People are going to look at her. She's going to have to disclose this information to Joseph. There's all kinds of of social weirdness that's going to happen to her. All kinds of social pressure and anxiety is going to come upon her. And that feels like it's going to be stinky. However, that's a known commodity. I think we all know what it feels like to be looked down on or to have somebody talk behind our back about us. We all know that feeling. That's a known commodity. What she is saying yes to is something greater, something more amazingly supernatural. She is saying yes and submitting to verse 35. Whenever the angel says this, when she says, how is this going to come to be? He says, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you so that the one in you to be born will be called the Son of God. An insignificant girl is going to become the mother of God. And she's willing to say, I'm your servant. What you said goes to a process of supernatural submission that is unbelievably unknown. She's probably never encountered it. You see, first it says this. It says, the angel said, the Holy Spirit will come on you. The Holy Spirit will come on you. And that means that um, at some point, there will be an empowering or an experience with the Holy Spirit that creates a preparation. Uh, let me give you an example. In, in Isaiah... If you've got a Bible, just jump over there. Isaiah chapter 32. It's the same illusion. It's the same idea that is replicated here. Luke's sort of stealing a concept here. And this it's a prophetic thing. It says in verse 15, Till the Spirit is poured out, uh, poured on us from on high, and the desert becomes a fertile field, and the fertile field seems like a forest. In this verse which is an allusion to the same concept, is this. It's a symbol of the Holy Spirit coming down and making that which is unusable, the desert, into a fertile field that becomes a forest. It's the idea of agricultural preparation. She is saying yes to the idea come upon, that's what that means, Yes to the idea of the Holy Spirit bringing on her preparation. An openness to what God would do. I, I think we are most comfortable preparing ourselves for our own goals. I think we're most comfortable preparing ourselves with a little sprinkles of spirituality and then telling God what we want Him to bless. But in this picture, it is, I'm your servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. What, what she's saying there is, you, you let the Holy Spirit come on me and prepare me. Just like a farmer prepares the field. It's a supernatural preparation that's going to allow us insignificant person to become very significant in the story of God. I worked for a farmer 
one time, and I, I've been around a few few farmers uh, that would get up really early in the morning. They'd go down to a local uh, cafe. They'd drink coffee till 10. They would drive around, we called them windshield farmers, and they would look at their crops and do a couple of things and then go home at three, you know, that kind of a thing. Well, I worked for a farmer once, and he wasn't one of them. He woke up before the sun came up, and he hit the field, and he worked. He sprayed weeds. He kicked rock. He would cultivate fields in the winter. He would sand fight. He was constantly in motion, prepping those fields to put seed in in the hopes that something amazing was going to happen. It was work. The picture here with the construction of come upon you, the Holy Spirit come upon you, is this movement of God in supernatural preparation so that the insignificant can be a part of the significant. So that a 13-year-old peasant girl, a nobody in a nobody village, can be a part of God's story of full-on redemption of humanity. Are Are you alone with the Spirit enough to let Him do that work in you? Preparing you to be a part of something amazing? She said, I'm your servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. Now that's amazing right there. But secondly, she says this. He says this, the, the, the uh, angel's telling her the second part. The Holy Spirit's going to come on you. We see what that looks like. And the power, the dunamis, of the Most High, once again, El Elyon, will overshadow you. What does that mean? So the the dunamis, the, the power of the Most High. That means um, His might, His strength, uh, His force. It's mentioned 120 times in the New Testament. It's His power. It's regarding something that by virtue and nature is, is powerful. It's the power of God. It's going to overshadow you. Now, now listen to this word. It's episkiazo. Episkiazo. Epi means surround. It means literally this, to be enveloped in a haze of brilliance. Preparation and then engulfing. This may feel nondescript to you, but let's look at a couple of of texts that this is kind of alluding to. If you look in Exodus chapter 40, you're going to see one of the pictures of what this, this glory, this, this power coming upon is. In Exodus 40, chapter, uh, verse 35, it says, Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it. That cloud is, is the glory, the power, the Shekinah glory of God. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. There's one picture. This powerful overshadowing, overcoming. And then over in Luke chapter 9, at the transfiguration, toward the end of the transfiguration, in verse 34, while he, that being God, was still speaking, no, I'm sorry, while Peter was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them. It's the picture of the Shekinah glory, the, the overshadowing of God. And they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. It's this picture of like when the temple was filled with God and the priests couldn't even stand up in it to do their, their, their work when Solomon's temple was completed. This overshadowing is when the power of God envelops us in a haze of brilliance when we are dissolved into His power and presence. And she said yes to it. It is being so overwhelmed 
that our power, our ability, our desires fade in a haze, in the mist, in the cloud of God's amazing glory. That's how this baby was going to come to be. When we are dissolved in His power and presence, it is counterintuitive <clears throat> to all the cults around there. Because all the cults are going to involve um, physical conjugality. Are you with me, adults? This has nothing to do with the physical. It's a supernatural engulfing in the haze of God, the haze and the brilliance of God. M maybe, maybe you've encountered that. Step one's important, though. The preparation of God, the Holy Spirit coming upon us, getting our hearts, getting our souls, getting our minds ready to be dissolved in the glory of God. I, I met a guy, had a fabulous encounter on his face in the presence of God, surrounded by the presence of God overwhelming his entire face changed he came home from the event that we we're a part of and ended an affair put down the bottle and started to preach that is being engulfed in the haze the glory, the brilliance of God. And she said yes to it. Now, being prepared by the Holy Spirit, being literally dissolved into the glory of God, those two encounters bring about a mission. And it says this, so the Holy One to be born to you will be called the Son of God, the Son of God. That life will be given, that the mission of God will be fulfilled in you, the mission that is only partly for you, is mostly for someone else. She's going to give birth to Jesus. She's going to give birth to Jesus and she'll be saved by her Savior Son. But so will millions of other people. You see, her saying yes to the preparation of the Holy Spirit, her saying yes to being absorbed into and dissolved into the glory and power of God allowed life to come from her that was transformative in millions of others. How, how does a 13-year-old nobody, teenage girl, peasant girl, in a village that is barely even surviving, how does somebody like that become so significant in the story of God? by saying yes to the Holy Spirit, making the desert a forest, preparing it, making the field ready. By saying yes to being overshadowed, overwhelmed in, absorbed in the brilliant haze of the glory, the Shekinah glory of God. And then, what's birthed can transform the world. A nobody named Mary becomes a massive piece of the puzzle in the redemption of all of humanity. Beloved, <clears throat> um, significance is, is not created by us. 
significance is not uh, manipulated by us. It's not even brought on us by others. Becoming a significant piece of the puzzle in the story of God is simply this. It's a heart that says, you may send your spirit on me and prepare me, whether that is painful or not. And then I am willing to be absorbed into the overwhelming haze, the glory of God. So that within me is born the mission of God for the salvation of others. So will you say, I'm your servant. May your word be fulfilled in me. Will you? Lord, uh, what a challenging thought. What an amazing thing that you would choose a nobody in a nobody village to bring about somebody your son. So Lord, I I pray that for those out there who feel as though they're not significant because it hasn't been brought on them or they haven't created it, I pray, Lord, that they would begin to learn the process of saying yes to the Spirit coming on them to prepare them supernaturally, to be overwhelmed in the brilliant haze of the Shekinah glory of God so that what is birthed from them transforms the world. May it be so. In Jesus' name, amen. Can I read this as a prayer? I'm the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. May you be able to pray that. We'll see you next week.